So it's 3.30. Uh, good afternoon again from Mr. Lin from CML Retract. Uh, may I suggest that you all please turn on your camera um, to say hello before we start. I know that more participants will come. Yeah, it's, it's good to see uh, many familiar faces from all around Vietnam. Uh, good morning, Christina. Now it's 4.30 in Florida, the United States, right? Yes, it's 4.30 oh, in the morning. It's used to start the webinar by some sharing. Um, as you know, the new school year is starting uh, in a few days. On Monday, Monday will be the uh, opening day of the new school year in Vietnam. And I know that all teachers in Vietnam are eager to start the new school year. Uh, this year is quite special. Uh, because this is the first time that we applied the new textbook and the new curriculum uh, for grade 10 in, in Vietnam. Uh, so uh, can we start the webinar by some sharing from you? Uh, my question is that what, what are some advantages and disadvantages of applying the new textbooks uh, this academic year? And uh, what do you think uh, how, how digital tools can help you in the new uh, curriculum. Uh, I would like to hear some sharing from some of you. Yeah, for those of you who have already turned on your camera, could you please share? Volunteer. Yeah, is there any volunteer? So may I invite somebody from, uh, from Ho Chi Minh City? Mr. Long Vu, can you share how, how have you prepared for the new textbook? What are the advantages and disadvantages in applying the new textbook? Yeah, good afternoon, uh, everyone. Uh, hello, Ms. Chris Crevent. I'm Mr. Long Vu from Ho Chi Minh City. Uh, I'm an uh, work as an English teacher in uh, when we come primary school in the district three. Uh, so in uh, this year, we will uh, teach the uh, all of the students in grade four and grade five. That means uh, we continue to use the, the family and friends special edition of uh, uh, that uh, distribution. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I can I have a look uh, about uh, the new book. Uh, that means uh, special family and friend national edition for grade one to grade three. Yes. I think that it is uh, easier than uh, the last book, but uh, I think that is uh, many, many things that new teacher um, compare for this new school year. And you know, uh, the student uh, in this year is very special. Uh, they don't have a chance to uh, learn with more uh, finality about a book, but the book is only uh, Teach you about uh, some of the new words and ask some more about uh, science and math, please, etc. So it's, I mean, it's different from the family and friends special in original of uh, OUP. I think so. Yes. Yeah, thank you very yeah. much, uh, Ms. Uh, Long Vu, for your sharing. And one more sharing, maybe Ms. Uh, Nga Dao. Uh, I just hear that Nga Dao is yelling, Ding An. Could you please, your, your feeling. Uh, when you, when you are going to start the new school year very soon huh and how have you prepared for the new school year yeah hello everybody uh hello mrs christina i'm uh, now from Sela city uh, i have uh, i have been currently be a teacher of the local secondary schools uh, in Sela city yeah i'm uh, into english and i'm um, always uh, want to change my mind and uh, to change the way to teach in English, uh, to meet the global and local uh, demands. Yeah. So I um, uh, enroll uh, this course. And I, I myself have been um, taking part in so many courses, but this is the, the, the course I like best. Yeah. The first, the teacher is so beautiful with the, um, okay, I'm into her voice, I'm into her passionate. And a lot of things I can get uh, acquired, acquired from her lesson. And uh, although I was ill from yesterday, yeah, 
but today I try to bring a coffee and try to be on time in the class and uh, to say thank to the uh, the to the my uh, beloved teacher. Yeah, and um, I'm into the near uh, After her lesson, yeah, I work much uh, about it, and uh, I have a, a side in. Um, I I have you the new post for my real class at the first two weeks of my school year. So yeah. thank you very much for this course. Thank you for all, Mr. Linton. Yeah. Thank you very uh, much, uh, Miss Nga. This is the first time that we work with uh, uh, a teacher who, who lives very far away from Ho Chi Minh City. Sơn La is very far to the north of the country. And yeah. Simeon Retrack is very happy to work with a teacher all around Vietnam. Um, so we can start right now. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back uh, to the sixth webinar in the webinar series on English teaching and learning for English teacher in Vietnam uh, during the post COVID-19 area, uh, co-organized by CML Regional Training Center, CML Retract in Ho Chi Minh City, Vietnam and Regional English Language Office and US Consulate General in Ho Chi Minh City. Um, first of all, I would like to share with you some information about professional development activities uh, organized by CML Retract in the coming months. Um, as you know, besides this webinar series, uh, in the next few months, we will have another webinar series with uh, Dr. Thomas Webster, uh, another strong expert in English language teaching and learning uh, for uh, two other uh, webinar series, one is for university and college lecturers and one for school teachers. And the one for uh, university and college teachers will focus on academic writing and research. Um, actually, many teachers wrote to me that that you are interested in writing academic, uh, you know, writing articles to be published in journals. And if you are interested, uh, you can also we can also share information about this series for you. And the second series will be about the innovative methods in EOT uh, in 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 EOT classrooms. Um, and uh, we will disseminate information uh, to you uh, in early September. Um, that is the first uh, opportunity for professional development. The second one is CML Retracts 13 Annual TESOL Conference. Uh, you know that uh, CML Retracts TESOL Conference is the oldest TESOL conference in Vietnam. Uh, now there are quite a lot of uh, TESOL conferences, but uh, CML Retract. Uh, we have organized this, this conference for 13 times. And during the past two years, because of the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, we applied the online mode. But this year, face-to-face um, -face again. Uh, and I know that in looking, looking at your name and faces, I know that some of you have already uh, attended the uh, TESOL conference at CML Retract, and we hope to welcome you back to CML Retract on November the 17th to 18th. Uh, this year, one and a half, one day and a half. Um, about the closing ceremony of this webinar series, uh, last time I, I share with you that we intend to organize the, a closing session uh, after this webinar. Uh, however, when we discuss with uh, my administrators and and the U.S. Consulate General in Ho Chi Minh City, uh, they suggest that we will organize the closing on September the 14th. Uh, actually, it's only 30 minutes, but we need some time to get feedback from you by doing a survey and evaluation form to get feedbacks from you. And you will have more time to complete the assignments or, you know, discussion forums on the Tech for Teach platform. So uh, Ms. Huang Lang will send you the announcement about the closing session. Uh, and at that time, um, by that time, you will get the e-certificate for attending this webinar series. Uh, thank you for your understanding, your understanding about this change. Um, about the webinars today, today we'll, we'll, we'll talk about digital tools for uh, classroom assessment in ELT. And uh, once again, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back, uh, Ms. Kristina Kavach from uh, University of uh, Central Florida, the United States. Uh, Christina, uh, the next uh, two hours is yours. Thank you. 
Thank you very much. Wow, you have a lot of exciting things going on and a start to school on this next week. So um, assessment is perfect, right? Because when we talk about finishing something, we often want to look at and measure how effective it was. And so that's what we're gonna be walking through today. I'm going to um, share my screen with you and ask you once again to join our Nearpod. Okay, so you're gonna see, we're gonna work through the entire lesson today, once again, um, through Nearpod. So it'll allow us to you know, a little less movement between uh, screens all the time. So our code today is T3MZQ. That's T3MZQ. Okay, so I see some of you have already joined. I appreciate that. Um, I'm going to X this out, but the code is not going to go away. Um, you may recall that the code is going to be right up here in the center top of, of our Nearpod. So the center top of our Nearpod. So a um, couple of you have joined. I'll just wait another minute or two to get a few of you more um, logged in. So T3MZQ, once again, is our code. And it's so interesting because since we've gotten started, Nearpod has made some, some lovely changes. For example, I can annotate now, and I couldn't annotate before on Nearpod. Um, so right there above that is where you should see your code. Um, so some great new tools that have been added for the school year this year in Nearpod, okay. So as we move through here, um, just remember that um, I may be able to take your photograph or your audio and use this as a program of the US Department of State. Um, we like to share out all the great things that you all are doing, as well as some of the great programming that we have uh, for our, um, our State Department uh, English language trainings. Okay, so I see a lot more of you in there. So what are we gonna do today? Well, um, welcome back. And it's, it's hard to believe that we're coming to an end here, um, but please feel free to reach out to me. I will make sure that on our platform, I, I'll have my contact information as well. So today we'll do a quick review of what we've been covering the last five webinars. I'm gonna talk about backward design today because backward design is what leads us into assessment. And so we'll, we'll learn about backward design. We'll talk about assessment in ELT and we'll look at tools for assessment, both to conduct assessment and to report and gain data collection in assessment. And the way we're gonna do this is we're gonna actually use all the pieces from our previous webinars. So we're gonna look at assessing engagement. We're gonna look at assessing learning. We're gonna look at assessing project-based learning. We're gonna look at assessing critical thinking, and we're gonna look at assessing creativity. Um, so everything that we've done has been a foundation for our assessment. Um, so that's where we're gonna get, get started with today. So I hope all of you have joined our Nearpod because we are gonna start out with a little competition today, okay? And because I'm in Florida, I think it's time to go to the beach, okay? Um, so what I'm gonna ask you to do, if you haven't joined our Nearpod, please do, so we can uh, participate in a little gamification here. And what I'm giving you is a bit of formative assessment. Okay, so we're gonna see an example of formative assessment. So you're gonna be asked to choose a little avatar, a little character, um, and, and um, once I get a lot of you in there, then I'm going to start the game. And this game is gonna be a review 
of things that we've covered the last five webinars. Okay, so we'll see how much how much we remember and how much we can take away um, from from what we've learned again in those last five webinars. Okay, so I'll just wait another minute or two because I'm only seeing about twenty of you connected, but I see a good bit more more online. So all these questions are timed. You only get about, I think, 15 seconds to answer each question. So you have to be quick. And at the end of the race, we'll see who, who is walking away with uh, the prize of time to climb here. Okay. I think we're gonna get started here. Okay, so I have about 27 of you in there. I know there are a few more of you online with us, but let's start the game uh, so we don't delay any further. Okay, here we go. The real important question here, which are the purposes of using a tech tool. This is from our very first webinar. Oh, are we frozen here maybe? There we go. Important equation. doing great with that question for project-based learning. Excellent. from our last webinar on critical thinking and creativity. Okay, I'm gonna reveal our winner here today. Okay. Um, oops, that's our participant list. So let's just show names. So here is our winner, Julie. Okay, excellent job. Um, so a good little review of what we've been covering the last uh, five webinars in a in a very fun formative assessment way. And so we will be talking about that. So just to cover some of that, again, remember in webinar one, we really focused on our considerations for technology, integration, or just using the technology. We talked about our purposes, and that was one of your questions in our Nearpod Time to Climb there. So our purpose in using a tool, are we using it to manage? Are we using it for teaching and learning? Or are we using it for assessment? So you just experienced an example of using a digital tool for formative assessment or 
possibly even summative assessment in, okay. in this case. We looked at tools, Flipgrid, TED-Ed, Khan Academy, and Nearpod. And then in webinar two, we really focused on a very important equation, right? So a great teacher plus great technology, but what we need for great teaching and learning is that pedagogy. So looking at blended and flipped learning, hybrid and high flex, virtual online environment and live online. So you had a question there about blended learning in our Nearpod. And we know that, um, I'm sorry, you had a question about flipped learning. And we know that flipped learning is taking that low level um, learning outside the classroom and then focusing on those higher level uh, things that require more cognitive load outside the class, inside the classroom. Webinar three um, talked a lot about engagement and we talked about the three types of engagement, behavioral, emotional, and cognitive. And we learn different strategies to build behavioral engagement by making learning active, peer-to-peer -peer learning, utilizing micro-learning, and personalizing learning. We also looked at emotional learning uh, engagement and how to build that. Building a community of learners, using collaborative tools, and just what we experienced, engaging in some gamification there. And then cognitive engagement, how we can scaffold our content, how we can provide time for micro learning. So I shared with you chunk, chew, and check, right? So we can give small pieces of content, let students work with that content, and then check their understanding of it. We also looked at some assessment reports in webinar three, and we're gonna be revisiting those today. In webinar four, we covered our project-based learning, and we saw that we can't really use one tool to complete the whole project, that we want to think about each part of the project and what tools would best fit each part. Um, and early on, I saw in the chat somebody um, was commenting on using Animoto for their class. It's a great way to present the project. So we looked at all different kinds of tools for that. And lastly, two weeks ago, we focused on critical thinking and creativity. And we um, came upon critical thinking being the ability to solve problems, to make inferences, to draw conclusions, to analyze and evaluate. We talked a bit about New Sela and New Nearpod and the free readings we can get from um, Project Gutenberg. Creativity, we really thought about thinking outside the box, getting students to repurpose or recreate. And we looked at tools like Book Creator, Animoto, and Flip. Um, so lots of critical thinking strategies, you know, using sentence framers, getting students to agree and disagree, categorizing items, problem presentations, creating endings and graphic organizers. And then with creativity, we focused on project and problem-based, but we really thought, talked a lot about focusing on the action verbs. What are the verbs we're gonna use when we give out these kind of projects? And flipping blooms and creativity rubric. And we'll be visiting more rubrics today and how you can build uh, rubrics for any of these activities today. So let's talk about how do you build a course or a learning module? So imagine you're going to be teaching a structure or you're going to be teaching a unit. I, I heard you say you're having new textbooks this year. How do you build that learning module? What's your process? So I'm going to ask you to share out here, okay, on our Nearpod. So how do you design a learning module? So looking at your new, your new textbook and you're taking maybe a chapter or a learning module, what's your process? What do you do? Okay, so I'm gonna be quiet for a minute and I'm gonna just ask you to share out. I'm gonna reload here. I think it's, we're a little slow to post some of these. Nearpod is. 
So let's see, sometimes when there's a lot of us engaging, there we go. That's what I'm looking for. Okay. Um, so um, outline, I see outline of the module, think, create the steps, anticipate the learning project. Okay, multiple choice, think about the objectives, then plan the lesson. Okay, very good. Discuss with your colleagues, good. Pedagogy and assessment, yes, absolutely. So assessment is a big part of planning. Um, think of the learning products, the outcomes, the assessment, excellent. Multiple choice, identify the key topic, lovely, these are great. Um, student level outcomes and then assessment, excellent. Choose the content that's suitable for students. Yeah, making content relevant. Okay, objectives, background knowledge, instructions and assessment, great. Chose textbooks and design activities to meet the learning objectives. Lessons are all theme-based, great. Your aim, your purpose, your methods, assessment, games and songs. So I'm seeing a lot of you really think about assessment as you're planning this out and, and that's critical. Okay, make an outline. Um, read through the headings, okay? Search what they are. Goals, make an outline, great. Okay, here we have objects, methods, teaching aids, activities, and once again, assessments. Study the output target first, okay? Again, our objective, our outcome, okay? So excellent. When we think about planning a course or a learning module, it's really important that we start at the end, okay? Um, and I'm just gonna share a little video with you on what's called backward design. And as you're watching the video, you're gonna be asked some questions, okay? You're gonna be asked some questions. So I just wanna make sure I'm gonna be able to share my sound here. Uh, with you. So I'm going to um, just play the video. And again, there are some embedded questions here. So another example of formative assessment. Um, but let's listen to this on backward design. Backward design. This short video will give you a very succinct overview of backward design. What is backward design? Well, it is often referred to as purpose-driven teaching. What exactly does that mean? Well, let's consider this analogy. You have some place to go, but you have never been there before. Are you just going to get into your car and start driving? Or will you first consider where you want to end up? and then determine the best, most effective path to get there. Most likely the latter. It's about thinking about that end point, the desired result, and then considering the steps to get there. Backward design and course planning is just that. First, consider your learning outcomes or the desired results. Then, how will you measure those? What will your assessment or evidence be? It may be a culminating task, a paper, an exam. Then what knowledge or skills need to be built to reach that? What are your steps? And what checkpoints along the way are needed to assess those steps? Okay, so you have some questions there.
Okay, so I'm seeing about 60% of you on the right track here, of, um, more than that now, but yes, we wanna determine the outcome. What do we want students to learn? What's our end goal? And then we need to think about assessment, even before we create our learning opportunities. So we think about the end goal, then we think about assessment. How are we going to measure that end goal? And then we can create our learning opportunities around that. Let's look at this simple example. Let's say our outcome or desired result is to utilize backward design to revise or design a course. What will our assessment be? Well, a successful course revision, one where learning activities and assessments are clearly aligned and transparent to students. What steps do we need to follow to get there? What could be my learning activities? How can those learning activities be shaped to thoughtfully move up Bloom's taxonomy? from remembering to creating. So while it's called backward, it's really the way we approach most goals, setting the goal or desired results, determining the evidence or assessment of meeting that goal and the path to get there. Utilizing backward design allows us to design relevant in and out of class learning experiences and helps us to determine the best instructional techniques to achieve specific learning goals. Okay, so that is backward design. Thinking about the end goal, then thinking about the assessment. So again, it's focused on the outcome and the measure of the outcome. And then we could put the learning activities into place. So a big piece of course design is that assessment. How are you going to assess the outcome? How are we going to measure learning? So let's just share out again, what are some of the ways you assess learning? What are some of the ways you can assess learning? So if you just, I'm gonna go back. If you just maybe put in the chat box there, what are some ways that you assess learning? Okay. Besides our traditional quizzes and tests, what might be some ways that we can assess learning? So if you just wanna share out. So I'm seeing formative and a set and summative. Excellent, we're gonna talk about those. I'm seeing portfolio, that's wonderful. Okay, so we know assessment doesn't have to be just a quiz or a test. And we also know that there's different kinds of assessment. Um, great, I'm seeing formative and um, scrap folding, learning journals, papers, outline tests, project portfolio, great, tests, projects, assignments, discussion. Yes, we can evaluate and assess discussion and even participation. A video for speaking or project, excellent. Debating, yes, I just had a debate in my class the other day, very nice. So lots of different ideas for um, assessment, solving problems, right? So we, you know, we've talked about project-based learning, but we also have problem-based learning, right? Where students are solving a problem over time. So when we talk about digital tools for classroom assessment in ELT, we need to have a really clear understanding of what do we mean by assessment? Well, assessment has many different pieces, right? So it has functions. The function, what we have to determine our purpose there in using the assessment. Is our purpose for placement or is our purpose for to diagnose and um, assess learning? Okay, so what's our purpose there? What's our purpose? So that's one piece of assessment one piece of assessment. Another piece of assessment are the approaches. Are we trying to um, gather some short information to see how students are at certain checkpoints? 
And that becomes formative assessment, okay? Formative assessment. So when we just listen to that little video and I asked you a question midway through the video, that's an example of formative assessment. I'm just quickly getting what we say, your pulse. I'm taking the pulse on our understanding of the topic so far. Summative assessment, we might even think of that time to climb. If I would do that at the end of this session, um, that time to climb could be a sample of summative assessment where I'm measuring all my outcomes, all my outcomes there. And then we also have to think when we talk about assessment, we have to think about the nature of reference or the interpretation of it. So is it a norm referenced assessment or is it a criterion referenced assessment? So let me give you an example. Norm referenced um, is when there's an assessment and students are compared to their peers. So in the United States, we have a, a test called the SAT test or the ACT test for college admission. And that is norm referenced. I believe in, in Vietnam, you have a high school exam that all students take, is that correct? At the end of high school, do they all take one assessment? I believe that's what I, I, I've read and heard. So that would be a norm referenced. Then a criterion referenced is where we're actually comparing students against the learning objective or the learning outcome. And so most of the exams we give in class are criterion referenced. We're looking at students' mastery of a certain objective. So today we will really focus on these four pieces when we talk about assessment. We'll look at the function of assessment as it relates to diagnosing students' strengths and struggles and showing their learning. We'll also look at both approaches, formative approaches and summative approaches. And then we'll focus on criterion reference. So again, that concept of backward design, this is our end goal. And how do we measure students learning up against that end goal? So those pieces will be our important pieces uh, that we'll be focusing on today. So for assessment, we need to consider the function, right? Are we using it for diagnostic or learning? We need to consider our approach. Is it for formative or assessment? We need to consider what? Are we measuring engagement? Are we measuring learning? Are we measuring a project? Are we measuring critical thinking? Are we measuring creativity? And that's when we can determine the best digital tool to use, okay? So once again, as I said in the beginning, we're gonna be looking at assessment and unpacking it based on everything we've done in the last five webinars, okay? So we'll look at assessment in relation to engagement. We'll look at assessment in relation to project-based learning. We'll look at assessment, uh, critical thinking, and creativity. Okay, so looking at assessment, we might have tools we use for assessment. Okay, we've seen lots of them. Um, things like what we're using right now, Nearpod, or even Flipgrid, or um, EdApp, many of the other tools we looked at. But we're not only gonna focus on the tools today, we'll also focus on how do we report and how do we interpret that assessment data, okay? Because it's assessment's great, but if we don't use anything, we don't use that information for anything, it doesn't really help us as teachers, right? So the great thing about technology today is we can use that data to inform our own teaching and um, we'll be breaking that down. So let's talk about behavioral engagement, okay? So we want to assess active learning. We want to assess students' time with their peers, right? We want to assess, you know, their 
concept of or how much they engage in micro learning. And so we have lots of tools. We have Nearpod, we have TED-Ed, we have Flipgrid, we have Khan Academy, we have EdApp, we have our learning management systems as well. Okay, so let's just focus first on the kinds of assessments um, we can do, right? So if we think about these tools, how can we use these tools to assess? How can we use these tools? Well, I think we have a pretty good sense of, of Nearpod and how to use it, because I've been using it as an example for you all as well, right? So we're looking at it um, and we're gonna dig into those uh, reports real soon. But I just wanna ask, share out right now, how can we use some of these other tools to really measure behavioral engagement or to assess behavioral engagement? Well, you may remember that TED-Ed is the one that we can use their videos, we can ask questions, we can upload our own videos. So right there, we can formative assess students' behavioral engagement. We can see how engaged they are, how often they engaged with it. Same with Flipgrid, we'll look at that in a minute, um, and Khan Academy and EdApp. So we will be looking closely at some of the reporting, um, but also how can we build yeah. some of these assessments? Okay, so you may remember that in Nearpod, when you log into a report, you're gonna get a general overview, okay? So you'll get the time, you'll get the participation of the student, um, but I'm just going to go into a, a Nearpod report right now. Okay, so I'm going to open actually another window here for you. Okay, and we'll look at some of the some of the assessment types, but also some of the reports that we can look at. Okay, so I'm just going to open up some of my my lessons here. Okay, I actually I'll look at some basic pronunciation lessons. So here are some different lessons um, that, and they're all assessing different things, but we're gonna focus right now just on engagement. Okay, so if I look at my reports, okay, I'm gonna be able to see my students' level of engagement. Okay, my students' level of engagement. So I'm going to actually scroll down a little bit to find, um, well, let's go into this one right here. Okay. So if I look at this lesson right away, what do I see in my report? Okay, so I'm going to see total participation. So that's giving me my, my behavioral engagement, okay? So this student here participated in 85% of the activities, right? Now here, I can see that they didn't report, they didn't respond to this one, and they didn't respond to this one, okay? But they responded to this one with the check, and this was their total time to climb score. So that's just giving me the behavior of the student what the student is doing, okay? Now, we're gonna see in a minute that we can break it down even further by the individual student um, and get a lot more information on their emotional engagement, okay? But right away, I can see that. Now, the great thing about these reports are I can open this up even further and look at just the question. So here was an open-ended question, and here is how the students answered. So I can see right here that this student did not answer that question. This student answered, and here was the student's answer, okay? So I'm seeing right away who's engaging, and when we talk about the cognitive engagement, we'll look at the answers. But right now, what I want to notice is just who's answering and who's not answering, okay? And that's just for this particular question. 
if I go to the next question, I can, again, see each individual student. So this student didn't submit, and here's this student submission, okay? So really carefully, I can break this down and look at that engagement for the students, okay? Again, I can go to every single exercise that is within that lesson and see it. So I can look at it holistically, how they engaged in the entire lesson, but I can also break it down to see how they engaged in each activity, okay? So I can really measure behavioral engagement there. I can really measure behavioral engagement, okay? So I, I have for us here, it's a PDF viewer. Um, so you can see, again, you can download these reports, okay? Um, and I can really get a good sense of overall behavioral engagement, okay? So overall, there were 25 students here, <clears throat> okay? My overall participation was 84%. So that means 84% of my students were engaging. I'm getting each student's name and how much they engaged, okay? Um, and when you download a PDF like this, sometimes their names are a little skewed, okay? So I can see right away. I can also see, okay, their, their cognitive engagement, but we'll talk about that in a minute, okay? But what I wanna really look at is right here, okay? So I'm looking at only 40% of my students engaged in that activity, okay? That's pretty low, right? Pretty low for that activity. So being able to get this post report session and really get a sense of, of engagement. Again, this is an example where I broke it down by my student. So this is now an individual student's um, behavioral engagement, okay? So this is how her participation is compared to my entire class, okay? So she participated 100% of the time. Okay, and I can go back and I, I, I'm able to see her answers as well. Okay, so real important when we think about behavioral engagement, remember the concept there is, are they, are they doing the activities? Not at this point if it's right or wrong, that's a different kind of assessment, right? But are they, are they actually doing the activities? Okay, so ed app, it's also very similar. Okay, so you may remember Ed App is the app where you can create lessons yourself and you can um, shoot them out to students' mobile devices and students can engage in, in those lessons. And so if we look at Ed App um, and I look at, these are my lessons within Ed App, but up here I have something called analytics. <clears throat> and in these lessons, again, Right now, I'm just looking at the assessment of behavioral engagement. So if I look at the analytics here, okay, um, I might wanna look at my, my course summary. Okay, so this will give me my, for each of the courses that I have, where my students are, um, how they're logging in and their overall engagement with that. That's take taking a second to load here. Um, so here we go. Um, so here are my uh, completions, okay? So I'm looking at the average progress. So for this one course here called USB Practices, my students um, only had about 39% progress and 50% of them have not opened the lesson. Okay, and here 83% did not open the lesson. So these are assessments where I send them to the students directly. So we're not doing them as a class, okay? So I can see right here, the overall engagement there, okay? I can also break it down by question. So looking at how students um, looked at those questions, okay? Here is an overall for just one particular 
class in EdApp. So my dashboard gives me a lot of information. It even tells me, um, and let me get my, my tools here, but it even tells me, um, you know, how much, how much time students spent in the lesson. So I can see their behavioral engagement there. How many are unopened? Okay, so I can see who's not behaving or engaging in that lesson. So really very telling information on assessment. So again, we're only worried about behavioral right now, right? Only behavioral. Um, so let's, any thoughts or questions on behavioral engagement? So if you just wanna share out any thoughts or questions you might have. Again, that's we're only measuring if they're if they're doing anything, right? We're not measuring learning yet. Okay, this is just if they're getting on, are they um, behavioral engaged? So, any thoughts or questions? Anything else that you might want to see in that report related to behavioral engagement? So some students prefer to work individually. How can we get them more engaged in group work and class activities? That's a fantastic question. I do think that, um, you know, there are ways that we can bring in peer learning using some digital tools. We can actually have um, partners work together. Um, one great activity, if, if, you, if you do allow mobile devices in class, is a partner scavenger hunt where they may have to go out and take pictures of different items using their mobile device. And they're gonna work together um, to then put the answers um, for that scavenger hunt. Another way is just what we saw in the very beginning of, of our session today, using gamification um, because I didn't show your names originally, even very shy students might, um, you know, might find a lot of benefit and engage in those kind of gamification activities. You know, students today, whether they're in, in first grade or fifth grade or 12th grade, they like to play games. They like to play digital games. It's part of part of their identities. And so I think it's great to, to build those. And at the end, we'll actually build, oops, sorry, that popped up again. We'll actually build a, a time to climb together. Okay, so we can see how, how you can build that kind of activities. Um, students don't focus when they're learning online. Yeah, I, it's a very interesting point. Um, in an online environment, there's a lot of distractions. I do think that we can really benefit from using digital tools in the classroom with the students, because I think it's important to show them and help them manage um, digital literacy. So using the right tools at the right time, right? So students tend to, I know even my students, they might be, you know, online shopping while I'm teaching them through, through Zoom at the same time. So how can we teach students to, to manage those things? Okay, some gamifications during the lessons include GimKit, Blockit, and using Padlet, which allows them to show their feelings. Yeah, I really think that, um, you know, again, it goes back to our very first, very, very early session when we talked about the pedagogy. We, we want to not use technology just to use technology. We want to make sure that we're using it for real um, relevant um, activity, for, for learning, not just to use the technology. Only good students work in a team. How can I encourage? Oh, great question. And we're going to look, when we talk about assessment of project-based learning, we're going to look at that more deeply, but we're going to talk about, you know, having rubrics at each stage of a project. 
So not only do we want to assess the final project that students are doing together with their partners, but we want to assess each stage and giving students a task at each stage, give, letting them know that they have um, something that they must complete at that stage goes with that shared responsibility. Okay. Yeah, I always want to give some time for questions because I know that you might have some burning questions. So just, you can always drop them in the chat box <clears throat> as well. Okay, so let's talk about that emotional engagement. Okay, so we looked at how we can measure behavioral engagement and we looked at the tools that we have uh, for behavioral engagement. But how about emotional engagement? So remember, you know, how do we build, and it goes to that last question, how do we build a community of learners? How do we um, use collaborative tools to do that? Um, and gamification can also build that emotional engagement. So we do have reporting tools on you know, on Flipgrid, on Nearpod, on TED-Ed, on Khan Academy, on EdApp, all of these. Um, and I just want to point out a, a few things to notice uh, on the Flipgrid. So I do love Flip for building that community of learners. And I know some of you, you know, talked about that because it allows students to see other students and it allows them um, to share out more about themselves. You don't have to be in an online class to use Flip. Flip can be great for students to, to use even in class when they're sitting face to face, but allows them to, to not only build their digital literacy skills, but that community of learners. And so a couple of things to notice when you're, when you're on Flip here, okay, is I love to always look at how many views that's letting me know if students are emotionally engaged in the activity. So are they viewing my video or are they just putting their own video up? Okay, so that can tell us a little bit about um, emotional engagement. And then are they making comments on there? Okay, are they making comments? And again, are they emotionally engaged in their class? You know, on Nearpod, what is the way that we, we work on emotional engagement? Well, I'm just gonna go back a little bit to our, our board here, but right away, oh, here we have some great additional questions. So you see what I'm doing right now? That's actually building our emotional engagement, okay? When I'm putting a heart and I see others putting hearts there, that's a way to build emotional engagement when you're working in this environment. It makes you feel more, more connected to the class. We feel more like a community of learners. I also encourage my students to write comments, okay? Um, so writing a comment, again, is a great way to build that emotional engagement, okay? Um, so, you know, tools allow us to do this. If we think about social media and when people respond to your posts on social media, right? It affirms how you feel, okay? And we need to do that with our students as well. <clears throat> and so tools allow us to do this. Um, tools allow us to do this. So, you know, here only good students were, how can I encourage all students to share their responsibilities? I'm gonna say, create rubrics for each stage and give each student a role, okay? So now that's posted there, okay, from the teacher. So that's creating a sense of emotional engagement. So everything as simple as clicking these little hearts, okay, to, to making a comment that can build our emotional engagement. Okay, that can build our emotional engagement. <clears throat> 
So another way to build that emotional engagement, oh, we already, sorry about that, is to really, you know, do those races. Um, and I don't know how you all felt doing that time to climb, but it, it creates a sense of a, a shared experience and a group. We're working through this challenging activity together, right? And it's that sense of competition um, really can help students get more emotionally invested in learning. And so we have lots of tools for that. I know that, you know, we didn't really talk about Kahoot in this webinar because you all were all so familiar with Kahoot already, but that's exactly what Kahoot does, right? It builds that emotional engagement in the class. <clears throat> so now how about cognitive? Oh. Are students learning? Are they learning? And that's, you know, um, we, can, we can look at so many reporting tools to do that um, and they can show both formative and assessment. And we're gonna look at those, but we're also gonna build one together. Okay, we're gonna build one together. So looking at assessment here, when we talk about cognitive engagement, we're really talking about learning, okay? And we can measure that using tools on Nearpod, TED-Ed, Flipgrid, Khan Academy, EdApp, and our learning management systems. So when we think about cognitive, we're gonna think about formative and summative. So to do this, I really wanna go back and to Nearpod and build a lesson with you that's going to show both, okay? What, how do we distinguish between formative and how do we distinguish between summative, okay? So I'm gonna jump back to my Nearpod. And what I really like to do together is to create a lesson, okay? So we're gonna create a lesson and I know we've done this before, um, but there are some been some changes. So let's call this, our formative lesson, okay? And this lesson's gonna be for, it's going to be with you in your Tech for Teach platform as well once we complete it. Okay, so a formative lesson again does what? It's measuring learning while it's happening, okay? So it's measuring learning while it's happening. So a great way to do formative is to include a video, right? And we've seen this before. So we're gonna include a video um, and you know, there's, there's so many things we can, we can do on here. These are some of Nearpod's uh, videos. Um, and so let's just create, use one of their videos. Um, let's say uh, we're gonna do, uh, well, let's start with the basics. What is Nearpod? Okay, so that's going to be our video. What is Nearpod? Now, while we're getting this instruction, we might want to add an activity. So I'm going to start playing this and then we're going to decide, let's see where we can add some formative questions. Our Nearpod's a little slow to load today. <laughs> you can do this with any video that you have. You can do it with videos from YouTube, as we've seen before, but these are great ways to build in formative assessments. So remember formative assessment is just checking students learning at that learning point. Okay, I'm gonna let this load a little bit and see if it gets better there. Interactive slides, interactive video, gamification and activities. As the teacher, you always know where your students are with Nearpod's formative assessments, including. Okay, so it just said, you know where your students are with formative assessments. So I can build in a multiple choice question right there. So I'm typing in my question and I'm just gonna clarify my question. Okay, so you're gonna see um, that I'm going to check the correct answer, okay? I can also add a third answer if I want to, 
Okay, and I'm gonna save that. Now it's gonna appear right here. And this is what formative assessment is. So during the learning process, quick checks to see if students are understanding. Now this can happen orally as well, right? We always formally assess in the language classroom. Um, but for, for digital environment, or if we're using digital tools, this is great and very, very appealing um, to students, okay? So I can add another question. I'm just gonna drag this along. I want that there, but let me play the video. So I might add another question right Center, here. Stations or groups. Toggle between live and student paced lessons. Okay, so I'm gonna end an open-ended question. Why would you use a student paced lesson? Because the next video it's talking about a student paced lesson versus a live lesson. And now this is an open-ended question. Okay, so students can write anything. So this is just a great way to build formative assessment. And it's again, formative assessment is showing students learning at different points, okay? But I think it's also, we can also use Nearpod to measure learning overall, and we can do it in two different ways. So we can do, there's two ways in which we can have summative learning um, on Nearpod. Okay, two ways to have summative learning on Nearpod. So I'm going to actually change our lesson to formative and summative, okay, lessons. And now let's talk about the tools that we can use um, for, for summative. So if we look at our tools, there are two that I think are really great for summative. Now, drag and drop could be great formative. Uh, matching pairs, very great formative. I teach vocabulary and I immediately ask students if they can match that vocabulary, okay? Um, draw it is a great way to build background information, but also for formative. Um, collaborate board, we know we do that to build emotional engagement, right? To communicate with our group, a poll, fill in the blank and memory test. So the two I like best for summative lessons, and I just see I spelled that wrong. Okay, the two I like best for summative lessons are time to climb and a quiz. So let's quickly look at time to climb. Okay, so time to climb is, um, is again, we can use it both formatively and summative, but we're gonna use it summatively here, okay? Um, so, so I just type a question in, okay? Now, again, with young learners, I can also even just use images. I can use images um, and, and, you know, give an assessment like that. So what type of ass assessment that measures learning during learning? So I'm gonna have formative or summative. So the answer here, again is a formative. Now notice in time to climb, I can change my time, okay? So maybe I want students to have <clears throat> more time per question, or maybe I want them to have less time per question. So I can change how long a student has to answer that question in time to climb, okay? So I'm maybe gonna add another question here. How can we assess behavioral engagement? And okay, so again, and now notice here when I add my time here, all my other questions get the same time. So maybe I wanted to give my students just a little bit more time for this question, I can change it. So this question, is 15, this question is 20. But keep in mind when you're using this tool that if you change the first one, all the other questions will be that same amount of time, okay? So I'm gonna save that. So now that becomes a summative assessment, okay? Another kind of summative assessment you could use is the quiz, okay? So the quiz tool also is a great tool for summative assessment, 
Okay. So very much like um, our time to climb. Okay. But the quiz tool is an individual assessment. So students are not going to see how one another are doing, right? But the time to climb is that competition of a, in, an assessment where a quiz is just an individual quiz. Now, I can add a timer here. The timer here, though, is very different. The timer here is an overall timer for the entire quiz. So it's not by question, it's by the entire quiz, okay? Um, so I'm just going to, uh, what is the state capital of Ohio for, for simplistic reasons? I wanna add another answer. Always having to mark the correct answer, okay? So again, my timer here is going to be for all the quiz, not just per question, okay? Not just per question. So easy, very easy to build formative and summative assessments in here, formative and assessment uh, in here. Now I do wanna ask while we're in here, if anybody wants to see how to build anything specific, if you just wanna drop that in the chat box, um, cause I know that a lot of you have commented on, on Nearpod and wanting to know more about it. If there's anything you want me to show you right now while we're in here, I will be more than happy to show you. Any questions, we can drop it in the chat box. I'll just wait another minute to see. Yeah, I think the how-tos are, are very, very useful. So if there's anything you need to know how to do in here, just let me know through the chat box. Um, in the classroom, that means format assessment takes during the course while some assessments are the final evaluations. Yeah, essentially, good question. So in the classroom is where that we're, as we're teaching, we're checking that teaching along the way. And that's formative assessment. The summative assessment might be at the, not just at the end of the course, but it could be at the end of a lesson, okay? So after we've done a complete lesson and students have not only gotten the lesson, but they've practiced with the content in a variety of ways, then that last <clears throat> assessment would be summative because it's assessing all of their learning. Um, for that particular lesson. So there might be multiple pieces to the lesson and that would be the summative piece. So great question. <coughs> okay, so I'm gonna go back to our, our Nearpod then and looking at, again, a report here. Now this is um, a report, again, that's showing me students learning. So we're, we're looking now not just at emotional or behavioral engagement, but did they actually learn, okay? So this is an entire class. Um, this is an entire class. So now what I'm really focused on, I'm really focused on the quiz and the correct answers. So if you look at this, and I chose this one for a reason, if we look at this, none of my students got the answer correct. Okay, none of them got the correct answer. And so what does that tell me as a teacher? Well, if 0% of my students are getting the answer correct, then that not only informs me of a student's learning, but it also informs me of my teaching, right? So maybe I didn't do, I wasn't able to accomplish my goal as the teacher. So not only are we um, looking at how is the student learning when we're looking at these kind of reports, but how is my, my teaching? So it also can help me inform my teaching and it can help me um, target my teaching for the next session, okay? I do see another question about um, Nearpod here. Can we organize all the quizzes in a library with Nearpod? Absolutely. So you may have noticed, um, and I'm just gonna save this lesson. So I wanna 
make sure I address your question here. So I'm saving that lesson. When I save the lesson, you're gonna notice that these are all my folders. These are all my folders for all my Nearpods, okay? So if I wanna create a new folder and I wanna call it quizzes, and maybe I wanna call it summative quizzes, and I'm gonna put all my summative quizzes in here, I would create that folder, okay? So that folder will be there with all my other folders now, okay? Um, actually, what you're seeing is there's nothing in that folder, but right here now is my quizzes summative. So I can just drag this right into my folder. Okay, now the really nice thing is, um, for example, if I look at this folder right here, okay, if I have quizzes in here, I can duplicate my lesson, okay? So right here with these three little dots, I can duplicate that lesson. So occasionally, and now I'm gonna save and exit it, so I've just duplicated that lesson and you'll notice I have two of them, okay? So um, here is warm up June with this two and here is warm up June with a one. That's the same lesson. Now maybe I wanna add this lesson to a folder, okay? And I would have to find my, my new folder. I can just drag it to just to my lessons. And now when I go to my lessons, here it is. Maybe I wanna add this now to my quizzes summative, okay? So this lesson is now in quizzes summative, but it's also in my grammar three course, okay? So it's also right here. So I can duplicate lessons and put them in different folders to keep myself more organized. Okay, um, so mine are actually organized by the classes I teach, but you can organize them by, you can create a folder for present tense. You can create a folder for, you know, a vocabulary of school. You can create a, vo a, a folder for listening lessons, whatever you want. Um, you're just gonna create your own folders. Again, those lessons can be duplicated also, so they can be in more than one, one folder. So I hope um, that answers your question there. But let's go back. So, you know, looking at that individual, looking at my whole class, but then I wanna measure each individual student's learning, okay? So here is her participation, but then if I look at her correct answers, she was participating pretty well, but she wasn't answering correctly, okay? So now I'm able to see her answers, okay? So I can see how she answered each question, okay? And I can see, so this is her draw it, for example. I can see her drawing and I can see how she did and where she missed questions and where she got her questions correct. So I'm able to see students' strengths and struggles. And that's really important for measuring students' learning, assessing their cognitive engagement, okay? Assessing their cog cognitive engagement. So now how about assessing and using tools to assess project and problem-based learning. How, how about that? So, you know, in assessing a project and problem-based learning, and this was, this was uh, asked early on in the webinar here, but how can we get students engaged when they working with partners? Um, and one way to do that is to embed assessment throughout the project. So if we think about project-based learning and problem-based learning, as we talked about it a few weeks ago, there are a few keys when we talk about problem-based and project-based learning and assessment. First, we have to build informative assessment. So we need to embed assessment 
throughout the project. So what is that assessment going to look like? Well, we want to focus on the process and the steps and also the roles that each student has in that project. Okay. So, you know, I always like to assign my students roles when we're doing problem or project-based assessment. Um, so if they're, you know, if they're researching the problem, maybe one student would be the note taker. One student would be the um, reframer. So they're going to reframe the problem and what they've learned, okay? So assigning students roles and then making sure that I have some kind of measure for each of those processes and steps. And we're gonna look at that together. And then that final rubric should be a rubric that's for our summative, right? The overall project itself. And um, I'm gonna show you how we can design a rubric for free and, and what to grade. What are we really evaluating there? And then the idea of incorporating um, <clears throat> some self-assessment, some self-assessment. So let's dig into the assessment of project-based learning. So formative, we definitely want to embed assessment through the project and we want to focus on the process and the steps. So what does that mean? Well, let's imagine that our project-based learning is to create a class cookbook, okay? So this is our big project in class. We're learning about food vocabulary. We're learning about quantities. We're learning about shopping. So we wanna create a class cookbook. <clears throat> so what we're gonna see here is um, each project step. Okay, so if our first project step is um, the students are going to write a recipe, this is the overall project, they're going to write a recipe, they're going to prepare a dish, uh, and they're going to work with the class to create a cookbook. Okay, so formative might be when I introduce the project, what do we need to think about when writing a recipe? So how can I give that formative assessment? Well, I can you know, use paper. I can just have students verbally tell us what they need to think about when writing a recipe, or I can use a collaborative board from Nearpod, right? So I can just create a collaborative board and we're gonna create a lesson right here, okay? So this will be our cookbook lesson. Now, remember, I don't have to launch this whole Nearpod at one time. I can do one activity at a time. So right away, I'm just going to ask students, okay, what do, okay, what do we need to think about when creating a recipe? So that would be my first formative assessment, okay? What do we need to think about when creating a recipe? Then maybe the next lesson, I'm going to cover the language of measurements, okay? And then I want to make, give my students a short assessment on the units of measurement, okay? So big project, creating this cookbook, writing recipes. But let's break it down. I'm going to teach them the language of measurements. I want to assess them before we go to the next step to make sure that they understand the units of measurement. So maybe what I'm going to do is I am going to create a matching pairs, okay? So I'm gonna use this as an assessment and I can add a pair. Let's say I wanna use a measuring cup, okay? So I'm gonna look for an image on measuring cups, okay? Choose the image. And I can add a text, a cup of, okay? For example, okay? I wanna add another pair. I'm gonna search on, uh, well, maybe this time I'll just type in a tablespoon. And I'm gonna add an image tablespoon. Okay, 
So this is probably, uh, let's see, these are probably good tablespoons right there. Okay, and done. So now what I've done is I've built in a formative assessment for a mini lesson that's going to be part of my project-based lesson, okay? So cookbook is the project. What do we need to think about when writing a recipe? Then I cover the language of measurements, give them a short assessment on the units of measurement. Then I'm gonna cover recipe ingredients and I'm gonna provide a model, okay? My formative assessment here, students might brainstorm possible recipes and um, they, then I'm gonna ask them to select one and use the teacher model to craft, okay? So I may not use Nearpod here, right? If I'm getting students to brainstorm, you remember we used Mind Mamo, okay? Uh, so let me move this box. Let me move this box right here. But if you remember uh, Mind Momo, okay, that was a graphic organizer. And that might be what I use right here, okay, to get students to brainstorm recipes, okay? Then the next part of this is I'm gonna model how to ask and answer questions related to ingredients. And the formative assessment, I might have students work with partners and share the recipe. And they might ask questions, how much sugar do you need? Okay, how much sugar do you need? Um, and so they could do this just face to face, or maybe we want to use another tool. Maybe we wanna use a flip grid there, okay? All possible, all possible. Then the next stage is I'm gonna model how to describe um, the preparation of a recipe orally, okay? Now I'm gonna get them to practice with their partner. But imagine if I go into Nearpod, okay? I'm gonna save this. And as part of my lesson here, I'm gonna create a video, okay? I'm gonna create a video of me doing the recipe and I'm gonna use the language, okay? Oh, I'm gonna add content there. Let's see, it doesn't wanna add content. Um, so add content, video. So I'm gonna create a video of myself making a recipe, okay? I'm gonna maybe upload my own video of me creating that recipe. And then for formative assessment, I will have checkpoints in that video where students have to um, recognize the language I'm using for that, okay? So easy enough to do um, in, in Nearpod as well. Then my students are gonna present. And maybe for formative assessment, they're gonna do a peer review. And maybe I have boxes where they're gonna check the language the students have used. I would also probably do a summative assessment here where I would have a rubric with the units of measurement and the language students need, okay? So that would be a summative for the teacher, but a formative so students get to hear one another and pay attention to the language they're using. Then I'm gonna present a cookbook and maybe I would have the biography of a chef and the directions written out now, not just spoken, but also written. So I could have a formative assessment where they could check an appropriate biography and add missing information, okay? So for example, I could go into Nearpod here and I could add a fill in the blank, okay? And, um, just very, very simple, but right here, what I would do, um, I would just click the words uh, that are missing. And now my students have a fill in the blank, okay? So they can, as a formative assessment, they can see what's missing from that biography 
and drag the words over, okay? So assessing, um, again, their ability to understand the biography and what's missing in the biography. And then my students will create the final cookbook, right? Here, a summative assessment will be given, but the rubric will contain all the pieces. Did they use the correct units of measurement? Did they use the correct vocabulary? Were they able to tell me how much and how many? Okay. Um, were they able to write a biography about themselves with the correct information? All of that would appear on the rubric. So in essence, when we think about project-based learning or problem-based learning, each stage of our lesson needs to have some type of assessment. Rather, it's a formative assessment, which is more often what happens at each stage, and then ultimately that summative assessment. Okay. Any questions on that before I go into the rubric maker? Any questions? And you could just share out in the chat box or unmute yourself. Because that's a lot, a lot to unpack with uh, project-based learning and assessment. We really want to think about how we can do that at each stage, at each step. Okay, I don't see anything on that yet, but no, no worries. If you have questions, just type that in. I do wanna share with you a great tool that if you are using project-based learning in your class, where you can design a rubric for summative assessment. It's actually a rubric creator for project-based learning. And um, it's great to use because you can um, use it uh, by grade level, okay? So if you are working on writing, if the project-based learning is going to be a writing task, you would follow here. If it's going to be related to science, if it's an oral presentation or some kind of multimedia presentation, like a digital story um, that we've talked about in the past. But let's look at oral presentation and I'll just click grades uh, five through eight here. So when I go and click oral presentation grades five through eight, I'm going to actually, um, you know, you're going to put in your name, the project title, let's say it's our cookbook, okay, and, and then the content. So first I want to give a grade on content and um, what do I want to choose from the list? Um, I use words, my audience, my vocabulary was strong. Um, I use supportive details, the information I gave, um, I was able to answer. So I would add those from the list. And right now, this is, these are the points that my rubric will have that I'm grading on, okay? So now maybe I wanna talk about delivery, okay? I wanna open these keywords. Okay, my voice varied in pitch. I use meaningful gestures. I use standard grammar. Okay, I maintained eye contact. My pronunciation was clear. My rate of speech was neither too fast nor too slow. Then I'm gonna add this right there. All of those appear, okay. Maybe I wanna talk about um, my organization now, and I'm gonna open these pieces, okay? I organize my ideas in a meaningful way, okay? Um, I used helpful transitions, and I'm gonna add those to my list, okay? I can add um, all of these pieces, and at the end, I'm able to create a printable checklist, okay? Um, I'm able to create a checklist that I can then use as a grading tool, okay? So I can just check these off for students, okay? In, in some cases, you can modify these, okay? So if you don't, if you wanna change them or add your own, 
that's a possibility. But this is a great tool to create a very easy rubric to score project-based learning, okay? So you have this link in our Tech for Teach uh, platform that exists in our platform. I do think it's important to share this rubric with students before they, they finalize their project so they know how you're assessing them, okay? So they know how you're assessing them. So again, you can even go in and type in your own uh, project or your own descriptors there as well. Okay, so this is just what it looks like. Again, choosing your grade level. Okay. Also, I think it's really important to incorporate self assessment. So when we're, you know, obviously we, you know, as, as English language teachers, we want students to use the language. We want them to have correct grammar, pronunciation, the structures, but it's also important in language learning for students to feel confident with their skills and what they're learning. And this is where self-assessment um, is very, very important, I, I believe. Self-assessment is very, very important for our um, English language learners because, again, Feeling confident in a language can change your success in the language, right? So getting them to self-assess using, um, it could be on paper, or I do think Flipgrid is a great way for students to self-assess. So you can ask them just to record a reflection. And this reflection might be, what did you learn in this process? How confident do you feel talking about recipes? How comfortable are you with describing um, the history of something? And even for our young learners, we can ask them, what did you learn? Just like mom and dad ask every day at the dinner table, right? What did you learn? So we can ask this even of our young learners. And this can be done through a video format. Um, and, and it can be just shared with you. It doesn't have to be shared with the whole class. But I also think on paper self-assessment um, for, for you know, students, the ages in which they're able to, to write a little bit more um, in English is a great way to use. Because really reflecting on what we know and how comfortable we are can make a difference in our learning, okay? So in summary here, assessment really requires us to think about the function, the approach, and the nature. Um, when we would determine these, we can really determine the best tools to use. So really understanding what's our purpose in assessment, okay? What's our approach to assessment? Is this gonna be formative or summative? And then what's the nature of the assessment? And, and for most of us, it's always gonna be that criterion, right? Where we're gonna compare it to um, the learning objectives of the class. So assessment you know, might require you to use very different tools, or maybe there'll be no digital tools at all with parts of the assessment. I do think the really critical piece is um, making sure we know what we're assessing. Are we, are, am I just looking at engagement, behavioral engagement? Or do I really wanna see what a student is learning, okay? And then lastly, using all of that data to help inform our own teaching. When I see students are not answering questions correctly, and that's why I love digital tools because we can see what they're answering, right? Um, and I can look at it holistically. If all my students are missing a certain question, I know I need to target my teaching better. I need, that's an assessment of me, not just the, the students. Um, so using data and leveraging the technology to inform our teaching is another important piece of assessment. So as always, I like to leave some time for questions, thoughts, answers. 
This is our last time together. So if you want me to show you anything from anything that we've looked at, any of the tools, any functionality, um, now would be a great time uh, to do that. So any questions, stop sharing and we can have a little discussion. Any thoughts, questions, ideas about the tools you've seen? Awesome session. Awesome. <laughs> Thank you. So may I suggest that you turn on the camera to make questions uh, before we say goodbye uh, to Christina. How we um, contact you after this call? So I, I will have my information on, um, on the Tech for Teach platform. The video you saw today on backward design, if you're at all interested in any more of those videos, I did put a link. Um, I have a whole YouTube channel on, uh, on, uh, on YouTube with teaching techniques, things like backward design, universal design for learning. Um, you know, so I know we were focused on digital tools but a lot of times we have to understand some of those pedagogies to understand the digital tools. And so I invite you to, you know, to look at those YouTube videos as well. Um, so we can understand because for me, assessment is all about course design, right? So, you know, we have to think about what's our outcome, how are we going to measure that? And then we can use the tools. Uh, uh, for learning, I, right? I have a surprise on uh, YouTube channel. So I will follow you. And I hope we will get more information about you and not the cost. Yeah, you're, please, please. And if you're on LinkedIn, I know some of you have already linked in with me, but feel free to join LinkedIn. If any webinars I do, I usually post them on LinkedIn. Um, so, yeah. I would encourage, I, I love collaboration. I love to hear what you all are doing as well. We better, can learn better, from each other. Make it better because uh, uh, two heads is always more than one, right? Yes. That's right, two heads are better than one. Yes. Yeah. So the word thank you is not enough for me to say, to express my feeling now. Uh, so uh, let's keep in touch. Perfect. I would love to. I have a lot to learn as well from, from you all. So I appreciate mm -hmm. that. Kristen, can question. you have a look at the chat box to see if you miss any questions from the participants? Uh, yes. i send you the name of the YouTube channel. I've already put it in Tech for Teach platform. So there's a link there uh, to the backward design video. But then from there, you'll see the playlist of all the other um, channels, of all the other videos as well. Um, I actually created those videos for my university, but I just wanna share with you all as well, because I think we, um, you know, we all, and you guys have been great about professional development and it's very important to me as a, prof as a professional as well to constantly be professionally developed. But, so I wanted to share those out to you, but you'll see those on the Tech for Teach platform. You'll also see everything we covered today as far as the you know, project-based learning rubric creator, um, all the reports, looking at reports and all of that. So you will see all that information on there as well. Yeah, any feedback you have, I, you know, I, I did put a, up there a final reflection. I, I would love to hear from you. In, in the Tech for Teach platform, a final reflection of your walkaways. What are you gonna use? Um, again, when we started this webinar, you know, we've looked at probably 20 different tools. We focused on a few quite a bit um, because I do believe it's much better to focus on, really learn how to use one or two very, very well than to try to use all 20 of them. Um, you may recall our very first webinar, I had a chart of all the tools and for different purposes. Um, so that's a great chart to refer to. I know our first webinar, we were probably 
our head was spinning with all of the tool names. But as we've worked through the last six, you could probably see where you can place each of those tools strategically for you. Um, and again, you know, it's always focused on what do we need the tool for? Don't be used by the tool. Don't just use the tool to use the tool. But what can, how can our students benefit from having that tool? I really enjoy this. Okay. I really enjoy this series of webinar. I look forward to continuing to participate in many useful webinar like this with you. Thank you so much, Ms. Christina. I meet you so much. Thank you. Uh, I think it's a time for us to take the beautiful shot from the card, right, Mr. Linton? Yes. I mean, yeah, I suggest I have, that um, you all turn on your camera uh, to take some shots. Mm -hmm. Yes. I have to wear makeup and I'm ready to get shot. Yes. <laughs> I have to the say, other I have participants, could you please turn on? All the uh, the tech team, uh, Tami, are you there? Uh, could you please filter uh, the screen so that we have those who are in the camera um, to take the you know the shots? Now, all the participants, please uh, turn on the camera. Yes. And in yes. the virtual background, we have with uh, us closing. Yes, me. Could you please filter the participants with the camera on? Yes. I want to, yes. Okay, and then we yeah we will take some some shots. background. Thank you. Yeah, all of the participants, please. Me, can you take the take the shots now? The background. Yes. Hello, Tim Chen. Okay, okay, we have already taken some shots. Um. Thank you very much, uh, Christina, once again for another wonderful uh, webinar. Uh, this webinar series is all about uh, digital tools. But however, participants learn a lot about teaching strategies um, as well, not only the uh, digital tool. So um, this is the last webinar, but we still have some other things to complete uh, before the closing ceremony, which will be on September the 14th at the same time at 3.30 p.m. on uh, September the 14th. Uh, from now to September the 14th, uh, Ms. Hoang Lang will very soon send you uh, the thank you letter, uh, including uh, an evaluation form uh, to get feedbacks from you about the implementation of the webinar series. Um, and uh, also as Christina share in the Tech for Teach platform, there are still some other assignments and uh, you know reflection from you. And we I encourage all of you to please access the Tech for Teach platform again to complete the assignments and the uh, reflections. Um, I hope that all of you will get the e certificates from CML Retract and Reload for successfully completing the, the course with us. And I hope to, to welcome you back uh, in future events, especially the webinar series that I mentioned at the beginning of the webinar today, uh, sometime in November and December. And I hope that all of you will attend the closing ceremony on September the 14th to say thanks to Christina again, to appreciate the support from Drillo and uh, of course, uh, our director uh, from CML Retract would love to see you and you know have some closing remarks for uh, this wonderful professional development activity. And I think uh, that's all for today. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Uh, have a good uh, national holidays in Vietnam to all my colleagues and friends and have a good new school year and have a good day, Christina. Thank you very much. Thank you and all. Goodbye. Bye-bye. Thank you all. Bye-bye.